Okay. Hello, hello. Hello. How are you? Good. I'm just going over the questions. Okay. Write it down real quick. All right. And I haven't actually presented one of these yet. So. Is there, is there a way to share screen? There is down at the bottom, I believe your monitor icon. Okay. Allows you to share a screen. Hey Dee. Awesome. Hey Dee. Okay, cool. Cause later I wanna share a certain resource that I love hey, giving you my fairy tale mm -hmm. students. Hello. Very excited for some other luminaries. Yes. All right. Who all? It's obviously you two. And then Lee and Jennifer. Okay, cool. Yeah. Lee is oh, coming so to us halfway across the world. Oh, isn't she? A, I heard somebody say she's in Australia. New Zealand. New Zealand. Okay. She is one of the loveliest people in the whole world. Just so you know. Awesome. Oh, took a short break and ran to the grocery store. And now I'm just like, snacks. <laughs> but, all, but also I bought more chicken so I can make more delicious bourbon barbecue crock pot chicken. Nice. Yes. <laughs> I ran to Target uh, so that I could get a my part of my baby shift gout. Baby shift gower? No, gift. Baby, baby shower. Gift for shower tomorrow. Wow. Nice. Um, I'm still tired. Um, yeah. And then um, while I was out, I got Panda Express. I love a panda. Yeah. I'm gonna put this. I'm gonna gonna move my one picture that's on this wall behind me. Nice. Oh, nice. nice. I just wrote myself a note that I needed to put up some art before um, the book stuff tonight. Um, Here so. we go. There you go. I love that, by the way. That's beautiful. My dad got it for me. He found it at a craft fair and he was like, you teach fairy tale all the time. I thought this was cool. <laughs> Don't you just love how parents sort of boil things, boil what you down to a very simple thing? Like, oh, you do this. Here you go. Hey, I will I will take this over. He also still occasionally thinks that I enjoy light up things and things that like blink. <laughs> do, so, do, do you still no. sometimes enjoy that? Not real, not like light up balls or the light up necklace that cheesy holiday light up necklace that, nope. but it makes him happy so i just yeah. take him and i smile and then i get rid of them later yeah exactly 
All right, we'll give it a couple minutes um, to let everybody get logged in. I figure. Um, Jennifer. Jennifer, I think you're supposed to, um, can you uh, try to join the audio? There we, there we go. go. Perfect. Hi. Hello. And then, yeah, then we're just waiting on me. Awesome. Oh my gosh, we're having another. If you need to deal with that, we need a couple, I'll give it a couple of minutes. Uh, we gotta have to wait for Lee and we'll let people kind of get logged out of the previous session and into ours. So thank you everybody who's uh, already here. Awesome, we're excited to see you. Jen, is your, are your bangs blue? Purple, nice. <laughs> I like it. The one time I did my bangs blue, they took forever to grow out and they faded to green. Oh. Kids yeah. at the time. And they were just like, do you know your hair is green? And I'm like, yes, yes, I do. Wow. I I yesterday when you pointed it out. I would have been like, wait, what? Every single time they said something, what? That would have been much more amusing, yeah. Oh. Okay, Lee is coming. Okay. She said, give her five. Okay. So we can start and then she'll jump in. I'm just telling you that Lee didn't know for sure that she was on this panel. So it's probably <laughs> my fault. Just, I just, I love, I love Facebook. I just messaged somebody halfway across the world and said, why aren't you here? And she said, <laughs> honestly, yeah, no, I've had the email open, the reception chat going, Facebook going. I was like, I am reachable. Oh, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the middle of my PhD residency right now. So I'm like trying to keep everything straight. I just got off a meeting with Shaikhan Aid about budgets. So Ew. multitasking. Yeah, I have monthly meetings about the budget now. That sounds fun. It's going to be great, but we're going to have great events. I'm going to, I'm totally coming to Shycon. Yes. Yes. Come. Yes. Come to my city. I'm when already here. Shycon? I mean, well, for when now. Is, when is Shycon? Um, uh, 2023. 2023. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Labor Day, Thursday of Labor Day through the Monday in 2022, which That's luckily hard. is like, obvious. didn't pick that weekend for our wedding because that was expensive <laughs> as a holiday. Hey, Beverly. Hello. Nice. All right. Um, awesome. So yeah, waiting a couple minutes, seeing some Hi, people filter in. Hello, everyone. We'll give it another minute and then I think we'll get started. Um, introduce. Everybody, them. this is my fault. I just want you to know Lee is blameless. She is one of the most fantastic people in the world. I was not clear enough. We're just all going with the flow because it's our first time, like a lot of us trying this. Go with the flow is like been my watchword for everything virtual. Truth. Oh, we lost D. Deanna, what happened? Oh. Hey, everybody lurking. Yeah. Hope you're having a great time. There we go. Sometimes if I touch my mouse, because uh, I have an Apple mouse, uh, it will automatically back page on me, uh, even if I'm just touching it. So sorry about that. No problem. All right, hopefully Lee logs in in the next minute or so, but I'm going to get us started at least with introductions. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Oswald. I am the moderator for this session. Um, I am a writer. Um, one of the many projects I'm currently working on is a uh, kind of remixed uh, fairy tale where they're trying to take down the godmothers. And uh, I also teach a myth and fairy tale in modern society class um, as a research writing class at uh, two of my colleges. So Donna, do you wanna go next? Yes. Um... So I'm a high school teacher. 
history teacher. I teach Western Civ, and one of the ways that I teach about um, the lower class in the Middle Ages is by talking about fairy tale. I think it's a, an excellent way to understand what they were up against and how the world was changing. I also have loved fairy tales every day of my life since I was a little bitty kid. So um, yeah, a lot of my stories are twisted fairy tales or fairy tale influenced, so. Awesome, Deanna? Sure, uh, I'm Deanna Schillander. I am a writer. I recently came out with a book called Sophie and the G-Man. It has nothing to do with fairy tales, uh, but it's still a fun romp through parallel dimensions. I am also an editor for Rook Creek Books, and I am not a writer about fairy tales in general. I enjoy reading the heck out of them and the retellings of them. I just pulled, in fact, I just redid all the books in my office because I moved, and all the books, I just noticed this, all the books are actual retelling of fairy tales that I put on these shelves. So not intentional, Kathy, but that's how it happened for this weekend. Nice. Hi, Jen. I'm Jennifer Loring. Um, I adore fairy tales. My first professional sale was a retelling of Little Red Riding Hood. Um, I am currently doing a PhD in interdisciplinary studies. Some of the work I've been doing has been centered on fairy tales, uh, particularly queer retellings. Um, so it's definitely one of my major interests in fairy tales right now. And uh, I teach a class in um, advanced studies and genre. So we will definitely be looking at some fairy tales in that class. Nice. Awesome. All right. Donna's so good. She came twice. There we go. I was like, wait a minute. Is that Lee? Nope. Oh. We got excited okay. for a minute. Go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. So. Fairy tales span pretty much all genres with our remixes and retellings. We see them popping up in horror, romance, science fiction, fantasy, mystery, just pretty much everything. So just to start us off, why do you think fairy tales are so enduringly popular? They're, they're an archetype. I mean, they play on archetype and they their lessons resonate. Mm -hmm. Yep. I I would have I would agree with that. I would say that the simplicity, often the simplicity of fairy tales, I think just it leads to the ease of retelling. Um because the story structure is set up in a very straightforward, well, in theory, in a very straightforward manner, um, it it also lends to the additions and um, twisting of those same tales. You can you can retell a fairy tale an infinite number of times, or a myth an infinite number of, well, myths are a little bit more complicated, so sometimes, but yeah. Nice. Jen, anything to add? Um, archetype was exactly the word I was gonna use. Um, you know, they apply to so many basically everybody, um, you can make them apply to everybody. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about retellings is that they are using those archetypes and taking them in new directions. Like I mentioned earlier in my introduction, um, you know, queer fairy tales. There is um, a type called ATU 514, which is the change of sex or the shift of sex. And um, that is essentially a trans narrative. Um, it's so the ways that fairy tales can apply to uh, virtually everyone. Thanks. All right. So awesome. Sorry, I was just adding a note to touch on for at the end of the session. Um, so archetypes are a big thing. We kind of agree that um, they're all part of our collective unconscious um, across the world, and we see them popping up in pretty much every culture as well as every genre. Um, and we've seen the evolution of fairy tales. They used to be the oral tellings. They tended to be much earthier. Um, we saw them kind of sanitized by the Victorians. They became a lot more moralistic. Um, and now we're uh, kind of in the Disney um, era and moving past that into kind of reclaiming fairy tales as adult literature. So 
Um, what are some of the best retellings or remixes that you have read? Um, and why um, do you particularly like those? Oh, man. Uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, Vampire Snow. Come on, yes. you know. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> doesn't get much better than that. Um, a couple that I've read more recently um, that I've really enjoyed were Catherine M. Valenti's The Maiden Tree, which is uh, a Sleeping Beauty retelling. It is terrific but really beautifully written. Um, highly recommend that. Uh, Carmen loves Inside the Witch's House, which is, um, isn't that story amazing? It's so short and so amazing. Like the, you know, the uh, issues of hunger and eroticism and done in such a small space and done so amazingly well. So yeah, everybody go read Carmen Lau right now. Um, yeah, so those are a few of my favorites. Nice, I'm gonna pause us. Hello, Lee, can you please introduce yourself uh, to the group? Good morning, everyone. My name is Lee Murray, and I'm, and I'm a half-awake, um, award-winning <laughs> writer and editor from Aotearoa, New Zealand. My apologies for the, um, for the time zone snafu, my goodness. Um, very pleased to be here with you all talking about fairy tale. Sorry, I'm sorry for, for the disruption. My no problem. Uh, we've dealt with so many tech issues this weekend. <laughs> um, so the current question is: What are some of the best fairy tale retellings or remixes that you have read? Oh my goodness, I really, I really love. Um, I really love uh, fairy tales which uh, which tap into sort of indigenous stories. There's some absolutely beautiful stories like that, or 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 incorporate um, um, myths from from other cultures. And I was just reading the other yesterday, actually, um, Rebecca Quang's um, The Poppy War, which incorporates aspects of history and has that very fairy tale feature with this sort of whole hero's journey and the kind of she uses the rule of three in a, in a sense, but also brings in that uh, very, very strong Asian mythology, which I particularly liked. Uh, there's so many actually, um, but at the moment I'm really loving rediscovering those fairy tales that sort of tap into the fabulism of, of indigenous cultures and, and other voices. Nice, awesome. Dee or Donna? Um, so I love YA and you know, YA plums, fairy tale constantly I, to, to try and just isolate one or two would be pretty difficult. Um, there's some pretty close retellings like Cinder. Um, there's a, right now, Sarah Moss a series that's based on Beauty and the Beast, but it's um, the old version, you know, with Tamlin. Oh my, dirty, dirty, dirty. But the original version was dirty. So, so like it's sort of taking it back from the pretty Disney retelling of, of Beauty and the Beast, right? It's going back towards Janet and um, her getting thrown down in the woods, right? Um, so I, I, a kid shouldn't read it probably, but um, it's pretty interesting. It's like, it's like they're sort of stripping away all this um, censorship that has happened over the last 400 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. D? Um, my, honestly, my go-to has been for many years, Rick Riordan, uh, in terms of like, it, he just has a great sense of humor with this. So he tells the story from a, you know, it's not even necessarily from the God aspect so much as the half God, uh, aspect, uh, and it's kids. So you get to see these really kind of disenfranchised children solving heroic problems and being heroes. And it's just so, so lovely. But the thing that I, the one, so there's two series that I like the most of his. Um, the one is the uh, Gods of Asgard series because it, it dives into a little bit of the weirdness of Norse mythology. I mean, all mythology is a little bit weird, but uh, Norse mythology, they were definitely chewing something that's gone off, probably Ludifisk. Uh, when they created some of these things, it's great. Um, 
and the other one that I love, it, it's it's the crossover between the the Greek and Roman pantheons, but they it takes place at Amazon, um, except for Amazon is actually run by Amazons. Uh, I've not laughed so hard over something so ridiculous. Uh, it's just silly. It's lovely. But all of his stuff is great. Um, I, I listened to his uh, The Egyptian Gods one via audio, and that was that was excellent as well. Nice. Yeah. Um, for YA, one of my go-tos during the pandemic, just I've reread them a couple different times because uh, I just I find them very fun, but also just comforting. Um, Melanie Sellier has a YA uh, fairy tale series, um, and she just retells them um, in ways that are very like empowering. Um, for the female characters. And I, I really end up loving what she does with the ugly duckling um, tale, which mm -hmm. is not one you see quite as often as a lot of uh, the others that have been Disney-fied. Um, and uh, lately I've also, I really loved Julie C. Dow's um, Forest of a Thousand Lanterns, um, which is uh, Vietnam influenced by Vietnamese mythology, but is also a fairy tale retelling of Snow White. Um, starting with the first book um, is from the woman who becomes the evil queen. Um, and that's something that we're seeing a lot too, is uh, telling the fairy tale from the perspective of the characters, traditionally the villain. Um, I also really love Jim C. Hines has a, is hilarious and he's got um, a fantastic series starting with um, the step, step sister, stepsister scheme. And uh, Catherine Arden um, has a, uh, Night and, uh, the Bear and the Nightingale series and uh, uses mm -hmm. Russian mythology or uh, Russian fairy tale and mythology really well. Um, so now that we've talked about some of what we've liked seeing, what are some things we're starting to get tired of seeing? What are some tropes that you think are being a little bit overused these days? Well, we could do without the Beauty and the Beast story. I'm kind of, I think that, you know, now with female empowerment, I think that we need a new take on Beauty and the Beast and uh, and uh, women's sacrifice. Um, I think there's that can be completely turned on its head. So it's never been my favorite um, my favorite fairy tale, and it seems to have have always been popular over the years. Um, it's very Eurocentric, of course, um, but that's one I could do without, unless it, it gets a big overhaul, um, which kind of allows a little bit more empowerment of little girls. Uh, apart from the fact that she likes the library, which I entirely agree with. Um, the library is fantastic at the Beast Castle, but apart from that, the rest of it can go. <laughs> you, know, you know, you must be imprisoned. You must, um, yeah, definitely my dream library too. <laughs> but um, but the rest, the rest of the, the, the notions of the, that oppression of women and that self-sacrifice, uh, um, you know, and and also that sort of, um, you, to me, just you know, you must subsume yourself in in either in either support of your father or 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 some some beast, some man, you know. Um, then to me, that that it's time to move on from that kind of messaging that we're sending mm -hmm. little girls. And I think that is the thing we need to remember about many traditional fairy tales they are cautionary tales sent to you know little red riding hood do not stray from the path you'll be very lucky if a woodcutter comes along and rescues you in those final moments and um you know and i think of sort of some of the asian uh asian mythology which i'm and it's it's part of my heritage and it's only now i'm being brave enough to kind of explore that and I think of the hungry ghost mythology, which is, uh, you know, which basically are uh, spirits of the dead who have committed some kind of sin or transgression in their in their past life, and then they now now they're these kind of pitiful, distended, stomached creatures with thin arms, and they they are never satisfied. They're always demanding, and then these notions are associated with women, and so they they become very very similar types of cautionary tales to the Red Riding Hood and the Beauty and the Beast style stories, which which send these messages to to women and to 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 female readers that, you know, you must this is the way you must behave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really like that I'm back to liking things, but I really like the stories that that strip away those things. Subvert 
make the monster into the hero. I, I love that. Like that, I can never ever get enough of. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> I can never get enough of either. You know, raise up the um, the witch. Let's look at let's look at it through the witch's eyes. I could do that every dang day, or um, take the kid that's supposed to be scared of the path and have them be super brave. Like, like I'm taking this path. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, fairy tales were meant to keep little poor kids on the manors, you know, because the woods were dangerous or because uh, they were wild or because they were pagan, you know, all these changes were happening in their world. And so the shit out of them. Right. And to turn that around now and make it into, you better be scared of me when I'm walking on this path. Or to take the monster and say, it's okay that I'm different. I'm not other. That's what I love seeing in any retelling or you know, any kind of, of people who lift those monsters out um, and, then, and then look at the monster. What, what's the monster doing, really? Why are they there? The wolf's well, freaking sense. hungry. The wolf is hungry. That's what wolves do. They eat. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think that's the excitement, excitement though. Yeah, yeah, of, of fairy tale is that opportunity to reinvent them as time goes on and we move forward and there is, you know, geopolitical, social change and we've got this, these opportunities to revisit these very fundamental stories that are, are quite universal, you know, um, across across cultures and and um, and and reinvent them as you say, Donna. I think the opportunities, particularly in darker fiction and horror, which is um, which is our bent, <laughs> um, you know, we have that opportunity to to really write something fresh and 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 send a new message to to particularly younger cohorts of readers. Oh yes, I totally yeah, agree. I agree with you. Maleficent. Maleficent was really interesting. I did a lot um, of people walk away from it like huffing, and I'm like, that was. But it was well. First of all, uh, Angelina Jolie did a top notch performance in that. I think uh, just it it was both. She was both awful and and like beautifully humanized, uh, but also a t like an awful human. But even though she wasn't human, but she was an awful person and then also a wonderful person, um, which shows the shades of gray in any le like legitimate character. If, if it's black and white, and that's yeah. Well, so that may be part of the problem of many fairy tales, uh, of course, is that it's very black and white uh, in the traditional tellings. And that's what makes the the retellings so much more interesting is because of those shades of gray. Uh, the hero isn't necessarily the uh, the that pure soul that it's supposed to be. Oftentimes they're just as awful as the the villain. Only maybe the villain is actually really great. Um, so the the shades between and 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 diving into what makes a, a character more have more depth and um, and be interesting is is what I find I think most interesting about it, and that's com we've completely deviated off of your topic, Kathy. I'm so sorry. Sorry, Kathy. It's fine. It, it took an interesting <laughs> direction, and uh, it reminded me of uh, something I've always found really interesting is looking back and seeing how a lot of the tales were even revised from their original version. So, Little Red Riding Hood, I have a few in a textbook I like to use was originally an oral tale and it was much earthier. There's a version where she basically does a strip tease and then tells the wolf she has to go to the bathroom. Um, so he lets her outside um, with a rope around her ankle and she ties it to a fence and runs away. Um, and then a lot of the original evil stepmothers weren't stepmothers at all. They were mothers and the Grimm brothers decided they needed to preserve that image of the mother as sacred. Um, so they revised a lot of it and made it into mothers or stepmothers instead. Um, you know, so, Kathy, just to yeah. throw something out on that too, mm -hmm. in, in the medieval period, when a lot of these were, you know, fomenting, um, the first mother would often die. Like women died of childbirth. Women died early. Women died many times. Men would have multiple wives and for their own kids to inherit the most, they treated the early kids like assholes. I mean, there is a root for that too, because of women's position. And the only way a woman could have a good position if the man died was if her kid inherited. You know what I'm saying? 
So like, yep. I love to deconstruct that and look at the, the real history underneath it, right? Women's lives suck and it really is reflected mm -hmm. in a lot of these stories. You know, the story yep. of, oh my gosh, it's, it's a, it's a uh, Snow White Grimm's brother retelling where the little, it's the little boy who is white as snow, yep. red as blood, and his mother knocks his head off. The juniper tree. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I need to read yes. that one. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's violent. It's terrible. They eat him. She puts yes. him in a stew. And a pie. Yeah. And the dad eats him. And he's like, oh, this is delicious. Right. But it's a stepmom story. And she wanted her kid to inherit. Yep. And she'd had a girl. And the other wife had had a boy. And she was worried about her own inheritance. So oh. that's a gross story. I love it. So. One another one I really like um, that I find interesting because it's again and not one that's often retold nowadays. But is donkey skin, oh, um, yes. where uh, the princess, uh, the queen dies, and the king basically decides to marry his daughter because um, she looks like the queen, and so she oh. runs away and hides herself inside an old donkey skin. Uh, and I haven't read this one in a while. I think it ends up being magic. Um, the king ends up repenting his incestuous desires. Um, but uh, again, it relates to, um, if you look into the, the types that Jennifer was talking about earlier, um, you can actually see that theme a lot too. And you see it relating back to a lot of the same cultures that had a mythical taboo against incest. Um, so we see that a lot in um, like Japanese mythology and a couple others, not in, not in the Greeks, uh, but yeah, they didn't um, care. A lot of yeah, the other interesting. That is a um, really interesting point. I've just been revisit. I've just been discovering this book in recent times. Um, mm -hmm. Women who ran with the wolves, and it's a really fascinating. It's a very old book, um, and apparently I'm late to the party because everyone <laughs> else has read it. But um, and some incredible stuff about um, myth and the stories of the wild archetype, and of course that whole notion of skin and and your 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 true self, which I think you're right, Kathy. I think that. The reinvention, the remixing of, of, of fairy tales now very much is looking at that authentic self of women um, and, um, and, 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 and trying to, to create much rounder characters, more, um, more nuanced so that we, we understand where, she, where the woman is coming from and that true self and finding that self, which, which of course is, is also a lot, you know, is, is part of these stories because, of course, when you have oppression, what it's oppressing that true nature. I mean, if, even if we look at something like Wuthering Heights is a similar sort of, you know, story, which, which while in itself I don't think is intended as a fairy tale, it does have those same notions of, of that, that true self being subverted and being um, oppressed. Yeah, but it's not just women, is it? Because I was just thinking about, you know, we were talking about the what don't we like, what tropes don't we like, and you know that Prince Charming, he is such a player. I mean, who he who he's with everyone, right? He is just, <laughs> and that notion of you must charge in on a on a white stallion and rescue the poor damsel, and oh, just charge right over and kiss her because she's what she's she's begging for it, right? <laughs> you know, even if it's unconscious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. She doesn't have to consent or anything. Just rush in and kiss her. You know, I just, that's another trope that, that, that's part of the fairy tale, you know, the fable um, sort of catalogue, which definitely can go. It's time for that to move over and for mm -hmm. men to be flawed and vulnerable and, um, and, and have uh, just slightly more... I don't know, have to work a little bit harder to get the princess. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> more anything. They're all paper thin people. And that, <laughs> that reminds me too, Lee, though, of a lot of the, the older ones we'll see. We've got very passive, voiceless princesses um, who don't really do a whole lot. Um, and that's something that we're starting to see change into the more active. And um, that was a reason I liked Anderson a lot better as well. Um, the Little Mermaid original tale, if you haven't read it, is very different than the Disney version. And even though she literally gives up her voice, she is one of the more active fairy tale heroines. She's decided she wants a soul. She can get it by 
getting the prince to fall in love with her, she's going to go after what she wants rather than being stuck in the tower or in the glass coffin or what have you, waiting for something to happen to her. Um, Jackie, can I throw this out? Yes. If you go back far enough, you get past that bullshit because like the original mm -hmm. Tam Lynn, when you get to Janet, though things don't all turn out, she's the one who's kicking ass and making decisions even at nine months pregnant, you know, she has made a decision to go and fight the fairy queen, right? Which is a root of, of, of Beauty and the Beast back before, you know, Belle was kept in a castle. And what about like witches themselves? Okay, so they've been made into the monster of the story because they want to have their own life. But look they at want Bobby to have Bell. a garden. No, let's be real. Yes. They want to have a quiet space with the garden and nobody fucks with them. Excuse my language. <laughs> So yes, of course they're they've gotta they've gotta have something wrong with them. They don't need a man or want one. Well, and they're ugly. Mm -hmm. They've got to be ugly because only ugly women would want to be on their own. And two, they must be doing uh, you know, non-Christian things or mm -hmm. non-okay things, right? Not civilized things out in those woods, right? And they want to eat kids because they, you know, they they always it's just Mm, I love witches. Witches are the best in fairy tales because if you flip them and you look at them, you're like, that's a chick who rejected all the shit. Mm -hmm. And we see that that wicked witch a lot in the Euro uh, at least Western European tales versus in the Eastern. Um, we we're just talking about Baba Yaga in the chat. And Baba Yaga is such a kind of gray character because she can mm -hmm. be good um, and helpful in things in some of the tales and evil at the same time. Um, depending on who you are and whether you accomplish her tasks. Um, so I love Baba Yaga personally. I think she's very complex and, and just very differently presented than a lot of the witches um, in more Western mythology. Yeah, she's she's almost trickster, not quite. Yeah. I really yeah. have, a, I have a, I love tricksters. I mean, if we're going to talk about both mythology and fairy tale at the same time, like trickster stories are the best because tricksters on the one hand can do this really great thing. On the other hand, they can do this really terrible thing. And half the time they do great things because they did a terrible thing. Like Loki is always, always trying to fix what he just did. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh my God, I gave your wife's hair away. Okay, I'll go fix it. Jeez. Right. I just, I just think that those, those characters that, that are the example of no are the most interesting, you know, because they rejected Fairy tales are trying to crush you into this box. You will be in this box. Our society has decided that women um, will be carried around, right? And so- women Rich will women be, will be carried around. So let's talk about like Chinese. I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not a, an expert here, but let's go to Milan, right? Which has weird roots, but women would be couched and women would be kept home and women would be carried on sedans and- uh, women would have little tiny feet, you know, uh, with binding and all that stuff. And then Mulan flips that script, right? Um, and she's out of the box. She goes right back into it at the end, at least in the Disney version. I don't know if she, I've, I've read a couple of different things, but in the end, I think she does, in fact, go back home and allow her father to be in charge, but. But you just brought up Disney, and that's something I want to make sure that we touch on, too. So, so much of modern fairy tale has been touched, um, at least in America, by Disney um, and really just heavily influenced by Disney to the point that that's some of what, like uh, a lot of kids. That's the only versions they know. Um, I felt so bad once I almost made a freshman girl cry when I told her the real version of Little Mermaid. Um, I do that every year. And so how favorite. do we how do we separate ourselves from some of Disney's influence when we're writing fairy tales or how have you seen it done in books that you like? You have to read the originals. Yeah. I was just going to say uh, I go back to this as far back to the source material as I possibly can. Um you know, I love some Disney films. I really hate some other ones. So, um, yeah, for me, it's always going back to the source and then figuring out, you know, whose perspective needs to be told here, whose story has been kind of glossed over. Um, where can I go with this? How can I flip it? 
Yeah, we need to remember that some of those stories were oral stories, right? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. there is a, I think you made a good point there, Donna, about, um, you know, the different, what's fairy tale and what's myth, because I think those lines are very blurred, um, you know, because there is just not one of fairy tales. Fairy tales, I think, exist in all, in all cultures going back through time to kind of partly to explain things and to keep people, to, to maintain a certain culture. And so all cultures have them to a certain extent. And although we call, you know, fairy, ta fairy tales, traditional fairy tales, we consider them, at least in Western countries, to be mired in this sort of medieval um, grim's, grim tales type of, type of um, rubric. You know they're much broader than much much broader than that in general. I've forgotten the question now. I've got them. <laughs> how do we separate from Disney? But actually, that leads yeah. to another one. How do we kind of also um, separate from the very westernized uh, tales that Disney does draw on? Pretty strictly grim. Maybe occasionally Hans Christian Andersen, um, some Perot. Uh, but how do we explore um, fairy tales from different cultures? Um, in our writing without necessarily be, uh, appropriating those cultures. That's probably mm -hmm. where I was going. Cause I was, I was thinking, oh, what's the one with Maui in it? Um, the Disney Moana. One? Moana. And um, yeah, and it's kind of a mix of Pacifica, Pacifica cultures. Maui is very, very big in New Zealand mythology and fairy tale. He's the trickster. He's, and actually I kind of quite liked his, Character and I think partly that was Taika Waititi's involvement in that movie, which 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 gave it um, gave it a little more authentic authenticity to the to the to the sort of you know first people sort of tellings of those stories. But we need to do remember that that a lot of it's been lost and re revised, and because those original stories were were oral stories they were not written down there was no written language so so we've got them and they they change it's like chinese whispers that 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 game you know where you you talk and everybody adds a little bit to it or takes a piece off depending on the time and the the the, the socialization of the moment and the and the geo, geographical things that are happening the 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 change in in tribal boundaries, all of those kinds of things affect the way these stories are told. So often we've lost, you know, parts of those stories. And I think Disney has taken that very American notion of individualism um, and empowerment and, um, you know, you, anything you want, you can have it, which is, which is quite, I think, quite an American notion and not necessarily, for example, an Asian notion where, where community you know, the, the community is a little more important than the individual. I think that's where that Mulan thing has gone a little. Um, women are not supposed to, you, you know, that that is very anti uh, a woman's uh, socialization. If you are Asian, your the expectation is that you will subvert yourself, you will subsume yourself in service of the community and the family. So, so I think that, that these, you know, that these things have changed quite a lot. And the Disney perspective is a very American perspective, which has become, and because, you know, um, you know this, the, the movie industry is so centered around the United States and that massive machinery of, of film and, and streaming and what have you, that has become a very prevalent um, um, narrative i suppose mm -hmm. and and so at, and a little bit at the expense of own voices so i think it it it, it requires that creators you know um consult at least consult at the very least you know with these kinds of own voices and talk about how these stories have evolved and you know moana isn't one culture it is it's borrowed from a number of cultures because that maui that maui demigod exists in a number of Pacifica cultures. So, so, mm -hmm. and the story is not, it's, it's a, it's a modification of a number of different type, you know, pull, talk stories. So, but it is there's still that prevailing sort of colonialist uh, voice, unfortunately, that, that, that Disney has, has taken on. You know, just to add to that as a history person, I think that all tales, all these tales, um, 
have have a shape that they started with, but every time that they are reused <clears throat> by a different portion of history or by a different group or culture, they get their a new veneer on top that you have to peel. Like the Victorian, you peel away the Victorian veneer and then you've got this sort of like, um, you know, industrial period veneer and then you go back into the Renaissance and you have to go back and back and back and back. It looks like something that it really isn't, you know? And there are very few fairy tales that, that I'm just speaking from the Western perspective because that's where I'm at. But um, I always go back to Hansel and Gretel, okay? Because most fairy tales have been so stripped of their teeth and their, their blood and their bone, you can't even see it, right? But mm -hmm. Hansel and Gretel is one of those that hasn't been changed that much over the years. I mean, it's still got infanticide in it, right? It's cannibalism. cannibalism. Yep. It's, it's very, like, I and I ask my kids every year, I'm like, do you remember Hansel and Gretel? And most of them aren't even getting told that tale anymore. Like, it's surprising to me, but um, that's, it, it's funny because it's hard to get back to that. And there aren't very many anywhere, I don't think, that haven't been, like, painted with the new layer of history, you know? We don't want to scare our babies. We, we you know, we want to, we want them to get married and have kids, or, um, you know, all the, all the different layers of bullshit that history throws on stories. So. And yeah, and I think you're right. A lot of that goes with the Victorianization and, and Andrew Lang, who, while it was great, he went around the world and collected a lot of different fairy tales from different cultures. They definitely uh, got that veneer of civilization and uh, let's make this for children. Dang it. <laughs> uh, I just want to say this out loud. Lee has a collection called Black Cranes, mm -hmm. uh, Stories of Unquiet Women. Yeah, oh, look, there it is. It, it's winning all the these. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to put, put your foot in a more Eastern perspective, right? Because the women in that story are, are looking with that their own eyes. Right. And there's some really, really great stories in there. If you want to. There's a lot of fury in there. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> we're going to we're gonna break down this, uh, these, uh, these, these traditional notions and, and, and reinvent ourselves as something new. And it's actually an area that I'm just so fascinated. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because as women writers, you know, it takes a wee while to, to come to this place where we feel brave enough to to um, look at our own heritage and our, those those very styles that have shaped us and be brave enough and bold enough to to look at those closer and and reinvent them ourselves. My mum just gave me this wonderful book, um, Chinese Fairy Tales and Legends, which I've been really enjoying and looking for ways to subvert in my own writing. Um, uh, yeah, but of course the women, there's, there's this very interesting story that I've just read recently about this young, it's called the, the, the woman and the horse head. And basically this woman sits at home, waits for her father goes off to war, which, which of course they did, um, and doesn't come home and doesn't come home. So she sends the horse to get him and she promises the horse that she'll marry marry it if she if it finds the father which of course it does comes back and she says well no no i'm not going to marry you you're a horse um and of course she's punished for that for, for not keeping her word and becomes a silkworm effectively um <laughs> and and kept in a silk cocoon for the rest of her eternity and i'm thinking no and i think there's a place i think i need to rewrite this story somehow <laughs> you know? um, which i think is a little bit the beauty and the beast story to be honest it's that it's that asian version of the Beauty and the Beast story: Father leaves you here, and you must you must be obedient. And she isn't. Um, well, she isn't. She 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 is uh, she she is gifted to the beast, if you like. And um, yes, Kathy, it does. The Frog Prince stories is a very similar. So they do they do recur, don't they, across cultures? It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And we've got about ten minutes left. Um, I'm gonna ask some final questions, and then we'll see if we take some from the audience. Um, do you have any 
um, sources? If you're if you're writing fairy tales or trying to research fairy tales, do you have any sources that you really like to use? I'm going to share one um, that I actually have. I'm going to paste it in the chat and see if I can let's see if I can actually share this. Nope, that's a YouTube video. Um, can I share? I can share it. Yeah, maybe. Yes, there we go. I haven't actually had to do this yet. So um, hopefully you guys can see yeah. Yeah. this screen. Um, mm -hmm. So I really recommend this one to my students. Um, it's Sir Laloon Fairy Tales. And they have whole lists of uh, annotated fairy tales. It's not all of the fairy tale types um, that Jennifer was talking about, but it does go through them. And for example, we were talking about Baba Yaga um, and it's got one of the Vasilisa tales um, annotated. Um, it goes through the annotations and the history. It's got illustrations from across um, centuries. Uh, it also gives information on related tales, um, often from different cultures, as well as then modern interpretations and things. So that is one of my favorites uh, to what recommend. Is that called again? Uh, Sir La Loon Fairy Tales, and I put the link in the uh, chat box as well. Um, and Donna, the book that uh, Classic Fairy Tales by Maria Tatar is actually the textbook I use for that class. Also highly recommend. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's good. We also got an annotated version of that, though the annotated Classic Fairy Tales um, edited by her. Have you guys seen the Eternally Bad series? I mean, it's a goofy book, but... What's really cool about it is um, they pull out a whole bunch of female, um, uh, both mythological and fairy tale characters, uh, and tell their very subversive stories. And they're it's really inspiring. So um, Eternally Bad uh, is the the series. Definitely should check that out. I think um, um, Karina Bissett runs a wonderful fairy tale factory course as well, and she has a lot of fabulism resources on her site. So she's another great um, proponent of, of reinventing fairy tales and reimagining that work as well. Um, and I think uh, I love uh, some of the work that Angela Slate's doing in, um, in reinventing fairy tales as well. So the Australian writer, she's doing some great stuff. Nice. And, and Jennifer, thank you for sharing uh, links mm -hmm. in the chat as well. Uh, sure. uh, yeah, the Carter Law School is one of my absolute favorites. Um, it's run by two women who got their PhDs in folklore. Um, they offer classes all the time. Their classes are amazing. I've taken, I don't know, four or five of them. Um, and they cover so many different aspects of fairy tales. It's, I highly, Carter highly ha. recommend it. Yeah. Carter Ha is from um, Tamlin. Yeah. Nice. Do, do we think that, fa that fairy tales are a feminist subject, really? I mean, deep down, do you really think they're telling mostly stories to women rather than to, to men? They were uh, originally stories yeah. for women, yeah, mm -hmm. so. And, I, yeah. and that is largely where the reclamation is coming from because we don't want to read that story anymore. We want to read mm -hmm. a better version of that story. You know, I, I, I enjoy Jack Tales, which were for mm -hmm. boys. But what's really funny about Jack Tales is they're idiots. They're dumb. Yeah. I mean, they're lucky, yeah. dumb boys, you know. I mean, I'm not trying to make fairy tales just about women, but I the most interesting ones are the ones where the women – manage to get through the system but um jack tails are hilarious like he gets three beans right there's a bunch of them that he does something like that and it winds up like uh you know gold falls in his lap or whatever um they're hilarious i don't know yeah so yeah um Again, yeah, that's, I tend to lean more toward the uh, feminine tales when I teach as well. Um, and for feminist retellings, um, in case you're not following the chat, uh, Angela Carter's Bloody Chamber um, mm -hmm. short story mm -hmm. anthology is fantastic. Um, the The title story, Bloody Chamber, is a retelling of the Bluebeard, Bluebeard tale um, and just, just fantastic. Um, we've got about five minutes or so left. Um, 
So just does anybody um, in the session have suggestions or recommendations or questions for us before we wrap up? Yes, and I agree with you, Dee. Mercedes Lackey has amazing retellings. Um, you guys know that stories. Sean and McGuire is a folklorist? I, okay, Sean and McGuire has like 15, like, skills that all of a sudden you're like, wait, you do that too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> put her out there because some of her, oh my gosh, some of her YA is so gorgeous. Um, she's doing this series of tales about kids in the modern day that are fairy tale kids, basically. Um, but she is an amazing source. Like if you go read things that she writes outside of fiction, she's, oh my gosh, awesome. I have some really great short story um, anthologies that I use in class, but unfortunately they're all still locked in my office. At, it's been closed. Um, that school has been remote since uh, March of 2020. Um, so I have not been able to rescue them from my office. <laughs> all right, I'm seeing some really great suggestions. Oh, I need to write some of these down before, I, before the yes. chat goes away. <laughs> I think Karina Bissett is also a website called Enchanted Conversation. Um, I published a, a retelling there myself, but there are some really great, um, really interesting flips in that uh, in that website. So um, you should check that out, Enchanted Conversation, for some nice. some good fiction. Uh -huh. Any, any questions uh, or anything that you would have liked us to touch on that we have not um, from the audience? I'm just gonna throw this out there. Go this one's it. not, uh, okay, so uh, King Arthur tales yes. are really interesting to me because they uh, cross the line between mythology and legend and fairy tale because there's so many different layers and retellings and things like that. Um, if you want to see something that's not necessarily feminist, though there are feminist threads in it that you could pull with the witches and uh, things like that. Um, I, I, I just think it's really interesting because when you start really removing layers, um, you get back to you know this being perhaps a Roman tale uh, when the Romans were first in in England and things like that. So um, there's some there's some pretty interesting things that are still happening around King Arthur that are kind of fresh. Uh, I love I, I for for that kind of uh, liminal space between the two uh, mythology, fairy tale, legend. I also really like Robin Hood. I've been obsessed with Robin Hood since I was a kid. I just ignore the ending of the actual book. <laughs> uh, but yeah, any anything else anybody wants to bring up or touch on? Um, I thank you all for coming um, and listening to us just chat about fairy tales and thank you to all the panelists. Um, you guys have been great. Can I ask a question I really quick? Lee, did we wake you up? Yeah. Okay, sorry, it's my fault for getting the time wrong. I'm so sorry. Don't worry about it. It's like, I, like I think it's the. She's like, what? <laughs> Five minutes, you guys. She got up, pulled herself out of bed. <laughs> we proceeded to have a very awesome conversation on fairy tales with excellent recommendations. Round of applause. Mm -hmm. oh my gosh. Yep. Sorry, Lee. <laughs> No, it's it's fine. I think it's the first time in two years that I've actually got the time wrong for something and or, or missed something. It's just so New Zealand. We're we're way ahead of you, and so the actual day is different. And so it's I'm always on checking the time zones, and I'm, this time I just completely got it wrong. So my apologies. I'm just glad you made it. <laughs> now I'm going to have more coffee now. <laughs> yes. So um, thank, yeah, I hope the hope the rest of the convention goes swimmingly well. It looks like uh, it looks like if this is a this is a taste of it, then everyone's um, in for fantastic sessions. Some fantastic sessions. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks, thanks so right. much, Kathy. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you all for attending and. 
And now I just, I want to dive back into my fairy tales and, and rescue my books. <laughs> What and the fairy tales. Oh, what what oh, the fairy good. tales of the far future look like? So, thinking about to, something to take away with you, mm -hmm. we think about what we look back on. But in you know, a thousand years, what tales are they going to have from what we carry forward from today? So, and I'm I'm absolutely terrified that it's going to be whatever was printed the most and there just happens to be copies laying around so we're going to find like abbreviated versions of twilight everywhere <laughs> if you love if you love twilight like i'm not trying to yuck your gum but think about what the most printed things are and then we'll we'll is that what gray i think is so, the problem it's basically yeah, a video the beast is right there you know <laughs> so, so if if you want to try your hand at writing your own fairy tale um Take that as a challenge. Set yourself a thousand years in the future and try to write a fairy tale. Um, Sounds like an anthology to me. That then, or, or set oh, in mind yes. that you think will be told in the future. Be in that anthology, please, please, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I'll add it to my. I'll add it to the list. There's the thirteen list. people here in the room, so that's already a TOC right there. There we, we go. go. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for having us, Kathy. Thank you all for participating. This was awesome. Thank Always so invigorated so after these discussions. We'll have all a right. good rest of the con. See you later. You Lee. too, everybody. Enjoy more. the next uh, panel wherever you're headed. And Bye, see you, see you oh, later. Thank you. Holy. Bye.